So good afternoon. Um, I'm super excited to kick off the uh, the afternoon panel discussion on what the future landscape of investing looks like in this space, in this ecosystem. Um, it's been my pleasure to have uh, moderated or, or been part of this panel for, for a number of years. Um, my name is Pedro Mokrian. I split my time between Stanford, um, uh, between GE Ventures, and also another advisory firm that I have that focuses on early stage uh, investing um, and advisory work around the innovation in infrastructure, cities, and energy. Um, my background prior to that was I actually um, I am a former uh, grad student here of Jim Sweeney's, which is why I got roped into doing this, um, and, uh, and, and was one of the first graduate students at the Precourt Institute for Energy Efficiency uh, back in the day. So it's been a lot of fun, seen a lot of different things. Um, between then and now, I've actually spent six years on the venture capital side at a firm called Mayfield, um, and have advised a number of different um, multinational companies in the space. So it's my pleasure to introduce the panel, because um, that, that's basically going to be the most you're going to hear from me. Um, the panel here is, uh, has been picked because of the representation of the different stages of investment in the energy space and, and sort of representing different views of disruption that's happening um, and, and how those disruptions come to market. Um, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves. And then Greg is going to give us a, a quick presentation and then the format today is going to be much more of a conversation, um, and, and if you would like to take part in that, please feel free, um, you know, make it controversial, interesting, poke holes at stuff, make fun of us, um, try to direct it at me, and then I'll take the, the, the blame for anything before the panelists themselves. So I'll, uh, I'll turn to Debjit to uh, provide the background. Sure. Thanks, Bedroom. Um, so I'm Debjit Mukherjee. I'm director at uh, Next47. Uh, Next47 is Siemens' brand new uh, consolidated venture group, which I can talk more about as we get into the discussion. Um, by way of background, I'm an engineer uh, by training, uh, studied mechanical engineering, and uh, did my master's and PhD here at Stanford, so it's nice to be back uh, on campus. After grad school, um, I started consulting for, for some VC firms, and uh, uh, including a startup that was started by one of uh, the professors on my on my reading committee for my dissertation. So I got into kind of the startup and, and VC world pretty early, did some VC consulting, worked as an aerospace engineer full-time for a couple of years, um, and then made the move full-time to venture capital uh, back in 2005. I went to Rowe Ventures, where I invested pretty much across across all, all spaces. It was a generalist uh, fund. Um, but towards the end of my tenure there, I got involved in energy. It really was, uh, uh, was my area of focus. I felt passionate about it, and there was a lot happening back then. I'm sure we're going to talk about some of the differences uh, between then and now. And um, after that, uh, went to Clean Tech Group briefly, where I headed up the West Coast uh, research practice. Um, and after that, I felt like uh, I really wanted a, a view of what the corporates were doing, because I felt like they had long-term staying power in this space. And that's when I joined Siemens. Um, in one of its venture groups. Now that's become Next47, um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about it as we go along. Great. Abe Yokel, uh, I spent 13 years uh, in, in venture at a traditional venture firm called Rockport Capital. Uh, I was about $850 million under management focused exclusively on clean tech. Uh, and with Rockport, I actually moved out from Boston about 10 years ago, opened up the Sand Hill office, moved it up to San Francisco a couple years ago, and as of about six months ago, um, actually spun off with uh, one other partner to found a new early stage fund <coughs> called Congruent Ventures. Uh, we're focused on uh, pre-seed, seed, and early Series A investments. Um, we write 500K to a million and a half dollar checks uh, with a, an interesting follow-on structure to follow on those successful companies. Um, we invest broadly across sustainability. So uh, we take that uh, term as fairly liberal. Anything touching energy, resources, transportation, um, we can look at. Uh, hardware, software, we'll do incremental changes uh, that we think have real financial returns. We'll do very high risk, um, high reward investments that, uh, that are long shots but could be world changing. So uh, we're taking a pretty broad view of the space. Um, this is not because we're special but because the sector has been challenged. I think we're one of the first new early stage funds to be, have been formed in the last couple years focused on the space. Uh, Greg Katz. I, I also had the pleasure of being at Stanford for two years, did my MBA here, worked in the Clinton administration back when they believed in science, um, was the director of financing for efficiency and renewables, 
worked at Good Energies, which I think is the first large firm investing just in clean energy as a managing director there. And I'm going to talk a bit today about a new fund, which is, uh, has a federal low-cost debt as part of it. So it's sort of a new model of financing. I'm Dave Rogers. I got added to this panel uh, late, so I'm not in your brochure. I'm kind of a rare bird in Silicon Valley, as I'm not interested particularly in technology or early stage. I'm here because uh, I bring diversity in the thought of having been uh, historically one who's worked on building or developing or financing or buying or selling actual projects or companies with uh, substantial uh, assets in, in the ground or on the sea working away. Uh, I was uh, for 30 years a lawyer uh, with a large law firm, Latham & Watkins. I ran the project finance group there for many years. Uh, at least within the group I ran, it was, we, I don't know, we had many high hundreds of billions of dollars worth of projects that we did. Um, and uh, across a lot of sectors and lost, you know, around a lot of places in the world. So the thing that I'll bring to the panel is a perspective that it's not all about technology. It's also about scale up. We've got to figure out how, once a technology is developed, how it's going to get um, scaled up in a large way. I see one of my friends and former students here. I uh, also teach uh, clean energy project development finance for the last three years at the GSB and the law school, mostly GSB. And then we also have engineering PhDs in the class. And so we focus in that class on trying to how do we get um, uh, projects built using new technologies and what point does something become eligible for vast amounts of low-cost capital because at the end of the day that's where it all has to be if we're going to really move the needle thank you so Greg if you'd like to so while, while Greg is uh, stepping up to to uh, to get to his presentation one of the themes that, uh, that I thought would be interesting to cover right now is that, that there's a unique point in time that we're at, which is 2017, um, ne never mind what's going on in, in sort of the, uh, uh, in, in Washington, but if you just think about it from a time perspective, um, going back exactly 10 years ago was 2007, and 2007 was the height of the hubris of what was going on in the clean tech space in terms of all the investments that were being made across a whole slew of different technologies that for whatever reason may or may not have worked out. And then you advance five years from there and you have 2012. And 2012 is interesting because it actually is an indication of the other extreme end of the pendulum swing where a lot of the traditional um, specifically vertically focused funds starting to actually shut down. So it was the, the bottom point of investment in the energy um, infrastructure space at large. And now 2017, as Abe was pointing out, is sort of the, the, the dawn of a new set of breeds um, of, of investment opportunities, where Abe hopefully will talk about some of the, your thesis in a second and what Greg was speaking of in terms of these hybrid approaches. So it's been a really interesting decade as it comes to investment. And so um, that's going to be the theme that we'd like to talk about today. But before we do that, Greg, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much. So um, this is a cover of a, a book I wrote on costs and benefits of greening buildings and cities. I'm going to talk a little bit about that because I think that's going to be the biggest driver. I'll just say there's, that's on Amazon. There are only 117 shopping days till Christmas. <laughs> um, this was an ad that Exxon, uh, which was called Humble back then, ran in 1962, in which they boast that every day Humble supplies enough energy to melt 7 million tons of glacier. <laughs> <laughs> that's ignoring the CO2's impact on the atmosphere. Um, so the you know the 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 sharp drop in venture capital and investing in clean energy has really created a need for more financing. These are some of the firms I've been involved in financing. The way to think about these firms today, in part, are some of these are very hardware and capital intensive. So an EverPower, Trina Solar, some of them are very software oriented and capital light. So My Energy or a Tendril, 
And that matters because in a, in a period where you have relatively little capital going into clean energy and you're a growth stage company on the bottom left-hand side, you've raised a couple million, you've got a couple million dollar projects in the ground. If I'm a software company, I can raise VC money. It's not capital intensive. But if I'm building wind or solar or ground source heat pumps, raising project finance to, do, to, to build these projects from VC is just much too expensive. And banks will only provide debt financing if you get to 40 or $50 million in scale. So there's this huge clean energy financing gap. So many of the firms that we talk to that are, have innovative approaches for scaling clean energy can't get the capital to grow, and they're not viable for VC funding. So one of the new uh, approaches to this is a firm that we're just, we just launched. We're approved as a small business investment company. Those have been around for 50 years. They leveraged low-cost debt. It was critical capital for growth of, ten, of uh, 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 thousands of, of companies, including Apple and Intel. And the way it works is we, as a, and we provide debt into a clean energy development company, which they then in turn use to do project finance with a PPA structure, and we have an ownership stake in that. We can do up to 20 or 25 million, and we think at the end of that cycle, they'll be large enough to qualify for bank debt. We think this is a critical gap in the market, and we think it's a, a kind of a, a new take on an old structure to provide financing that is essentially leveraged debt. So I'm gonna talk about cities, because cities are extraordinarily important to our transition to low carbon. This is the same place 21 years later you can see this sort of rate of Asian construction. There's only one building that's similar in both of those. Two-thirds of CO2 is in cities. So cities is really what matters in our transition. Um, and it, what's important is that outcomes matter at a city level rather than politics. So it's about budgets and, and issues that are considered externalities for businesses. So health, employment, and tourism matter to cities. Cities can drive large changes in carbon. They have great specification power, and because they're there for a long term, they've got relatively good credit rating. All of these provide leverage opportunities. The impacts of climate change on energy and building design is already manifest in increased need for air conditioning and reduced uh, need for heating. Um, when you think about benefits, here's, a, here's cool roofs. So a lighter color roof, the cost of that is 76 cents per square foot. The benefit to the building owner is a buck 34. The, the, the size of the benefits, mostly related to health, including reduced heat mortality, is about $5 a square foot. So what's exciting about cities is that the financial benefits, which a private sector company would think about as an externality, a city would not think about as an externality. It's a city's responsibility to think about citizens' health. Many of them have commitments on CO2, um, and they worry about heat mortality. And so cities are a really powerful uh, opportunity set for driving technology and, and funding. Uh, again, additional cost for doing, um, for, uh, for doing a green, so a lead office building, is at around four bucks a square foot. The green, dark green and blue bar are the direct benefits to the building. When you start stacking up the additional benefits, which accrue at a campus level or a city level, it dominates. And when you take a step back and say, when you add up those externalities relative to the cost on a net present value basis over 20 years, the return is a 10x. That's a very compelling return proposition if you think externalities are actually internalities. And there are a lot of additional benefits we're not able to quantify. It's written up in this book. Because of work like this, cities across the country said, OK, this gives us quantification on what we knew, that it's smart to do green buildings. We're going to require that all public buildings be green going forward. And we're now looking at what are called smart surfaces, a lot of clean, clean uh, tech technologies from cool roof, green roof, solar, PV, water, and other things. And what we're finding is that when you map this against a city in terms of benefits, the net present value is very large. So those are the costs at the top, first cost, O&M cost, but you get energy benefits, stormwater health, uh, potable water benefits, which aggregates. This slide is actually cut off, but it shows about a $2 billion net present value for Washington, D.C. to take all of their surfaces and make them one of these technologies, cool roofs, PV, green roofs, permeable. But that doesn't get at other benefits. So D.C., where I live, and by the way, I have a proud to say we have an uh, uh, electric car, which for four years has been running off PV on my roof. 
we're going to roughly triple the number of 95 degree days. And that's just not because of, it's not only because of the hot air coming out of politicians, it's from climate change. And that means that the city functionally becomes unlivable for one or two months in the summer. So what we did is we said, where can we, where can we figure out the quantification of impact here? It's on tourism. So 5% avoided loss in tourism for DC, which is reasonable from reducing your excess heat in the summer, adds about $3 billion in net present value. For Philadelphia, the number is about five. So what we found is for DC net present value of adopting these strategies citywide is about five billion, and uh, in Philadelphia, it's about $8 billion. Cities are also in a very powerful position to drive innovation and carbon sequestration. So cap carbon capture and sequestration, very expensive, involves separation, piping, putting the stuff in the ground, which then leaks. A, plant, uh, a company south of here called Blue Planet is one of a, a suite of new companies that's developed a way to, to, to uh, sequester carbon. They do it in aggregate. That's a pour at the San Francisco airport where many of you flew into. They're, they're pouring cement that's used aggregate made with CO2. I think it's the first carbon sequestering commercial product sold in this country. Um, and then people have talked about PPAs before, but I think this is so extraordinary that you're seeing long-term purchase power agreements coming in at four, three, four, or five cents a kilowatt hour. So about one third of the cost of electricity in a place like California. So cities are just beginning to get into the business of doing direct long-term contracts to buy power uh, and to go to zero net carbon. I'll just mention one last thing, which is um, working with the former president of um, Stanford, Don Kennedy, about five years ago, we launched an initiative called co 2 de which is about correcting a market mispricing. So if I do an energy efficiency investment, the value of the CO2 that results doesn't go to, to us. It defaults to the utility. So this is an initiative to say, look, if you're going to have a market in carbon, make the pricing signals work by having the allocation of the CO2 go to the people who do the investment. So it's an indication of when we think about financing, getting the incentives right become extraordinarily important. That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, Greg. Um, a lot of interesting themes, actually, just, just from there alone. Um, and, and I want to just kind of jump back to the, the, the macro theme is just viewing the past 10 years. Um, most of you folks have, have been in this space for beyond 10 years, right? But if you just, just say 10 years ago, what did the space look like? What did it look like five years ago? And what is it looking like today in terms of like the, the really interesting opportunities? I know you're, you're kind of talking about how that's shifted. Um, perhaps you can start. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to. So, I mean, it's interesting going back to 2007. So at the time I was at Row Ventures uh, doing pure play um, financial VC investing. And things were very, very, very different. That was really the, I'd say, the peak of the hype cycle in terms of energy. It was also the beginning of, I think, a lot of curiosity and enthusiasm about the space. And you also have to consider uh, kind of what the, what the pricing looked like. So if you looked at the price of a barrel of oil or you looked at the price of natural gas, the prices were about four times higher than they are today. So things were coming off the shelf that we hadn't seen before. Technologies that had been developed in the 50s and 60s were being dusted off and promoted. So it was, at the time, we were seeing a lot more um, startups and entrepreneurs coming up in what I would call the, the hard tech area. So we were seeing lots of things like fuel cells and batteries and biofuels, um, solar cells and solar technologies, new types of engines. It was really a, a, a diverse time in terms of all the different offerings we saw. And fundamentally, a lot of these technologies had become cost competitive with the pricing of the day. So um, it, it was a super interesting time. Everyone was getting into it. The VCs were talking about how the energy markets were much, much larger than anything in consumer internet and so forth. So it was definitely an exciting time, um, but it didn't last for too long. So if you fast forward to 2012, um, a lot of VCs by that time had, had started the retreat or had fully exited the space. They'd realized that financial returns uh, were not easy to come by. Um, the public markets uh, weren't, weren't terribly uh, welcoming. It was difficult to get private exits. Hard technology, hard science naturally takes longer. It's very capital intensive, and it didn't really fit, I'd say, the conventional uh, VC model very well. So by 2012, 
uh, a lot of the enthusiasm had died. Uh, this was also after uh, the stimulus funding of 2009, which actually helped, I think, along with the VC money, had helped uh, bring a lot of new technologies to market. Uh, so that, that period kind of died in 2008 and 9. In 2011, at Siemens, 2011-12 timeframe, I was still seeing, actually, some companies in the space. I think it was kind of the tail end. Uh, so there were, relative to now at least, more pure play energy companies at the time. I think between 2012 and now, a lot has changed. So it, it really has, I think the landscape of startups has really shifted. Today we, we don't really see nearly as many pure, pure play energy companies. Energy efficiency and those types of things are a lot less attractive um, in terms of building businesses around those themes specifically in a dedicated way. Today we're seeing much more around around data, right? So it's, it's, this is the, er, the era of AI and industrial IoT. Um, so now we see technologies like that coming into the energy markets and potentially disrupting. So it's about making better use of data, about collecting uh, information from sensors that are distributed, and there are thousands and thousands of them, and these impact everything from power generation to the way that we operate smart grids. Um, there's also been a shift, I think, in just in terms of what I would call consumerization. There's a lot more power at the endpoints. So we're moving kind of from a centralized to a thoroughly decentralized model where consumers have a lot more control and power. Um, and so that's really changed uh, fundamentally the types of companies that we're seeing. So um, I'd say the technologies are not pure play energy anymore from what we're seeing. It's things like AI and IoT and blockchain. Um, we're seeing a lot of service-enabled models, things like drones. Uh, I think the data aspect really makes service models um, much more viable. Now that you basically have pervasive sensing, you can charge in a different way. Uh, and so the new business model innovation um, aspect is, is pretty exciting. But I'm not sure that we're going to go back to the era that we were in in 2007, for better or for worse. Um, I can say that, um, and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about some other trends. I want to give the other panelists an opportunity to talk. But Hopefully we can talk a little, bit, a little bit too about what's happened in the broader markets, how VCs have changed, how corporate VCs are, are changing the landscape, what we're seeing with our own customers because there have been some shifts there as well. Yeah, I can take a spin at this uh, from a kind of financial markets perspective. Um, so ultimately, you know, venture funds and, and most fund structures are funded by institutional uh, dollars, whether it's the Stanford Endowment or... Uh, the University of California endowment, our pension funds, uh, and family offices. Um, so I, I joined, uh, you know, Rockport in 2004, early 2004, and we were the ugly stepchild of, uh, of venture. Um, people in venture, you know, a couple people dabbled in energy. Kleiner had done a couple deals in it, but nobody wanted to touch this stuff. Um, and then, and we had just, we had, we were investing out of a first fund at that point. We went out to market in 2005 to raise a second fund. It was really the first institutional fund, which ended up being about $260 million, we, we barked up a lot of trees, and people thought we were crazy. Um, it was a, there were a couple you know, traditional funds out there that had focused on energy, uh, materials, but not many groups had gone out and kind of talked about, you know, we, never, we never called it clean tech until we submitted a while later, but um, a, a bunch of uh, distributed physical assets out there that we were investing in. And it wasn't until the blackout of 2005 uh, when the eastern uh, grid went down, um, so I think it was a transformer in Ohio, if I remember right, um, that any institutional capital paid the sector any attention. And we went from kind of scrapping to try to raise a fund to all of a sudden being oversubscribed in like three months. Um, and, and the reason I bring this up is it's really about institutional capital's mentality around this space, and that is informed, you know, first it's informed by hype, and then later it's informed by returns. So the hype went way up. We closed this fund. A bunch of other solid funds kind of expanded their mandates a little bit and closed funds as well. Um, and uh, that's when I got kicked out of Boston to move out to Sand Hill Road when all of these Sand Hill Road firms started doing deals in the energy sector. And we wanted to syndicate because we didn't really know that much about venture. We just knew a lot about energy. It was an energy operating group um, historically. And so there was, it was complete go-go days. You know, deals pre-revenue were getting funded at billion-dollar-plus valuations. Hello, Silicon Valley. That was unusual for energy. Um, that has now become norm out here for traditional venture deals. Um, and then 2008 struck, and the financial markets cratered, and um, a, lot of, a lot of 
money. Yeah, venture funds were having to answer to their LPs saying, why aren't you investing in this new sector? LP said, we want some exposure. We think you're great venture funds. Go put some dollars out. And so they'd find the best you know, deals possible and you'd allocate dollars from a generalist uh, into the sector. Well, a lot of those deals were not good deals and you know, we were in some of those as well. <laughs> um, so I can't point uh, purely to the generalists on that. Um, and then uh, the tide went out and everything blew up. Um, the good deals uh, often kind of scrapped along. The deals that had high burn and you know a, a lot of fundamentals had changed from energy prices to solar panel prices uh, just went completely bottoms up in a very short period of time. And the institutional memory is 10 to 12 years from when you commit as an as a asset manager on the back end. And until that stuff, until those negative returns work their way out of the system, Funds like mine have a tough time convincing a traditional asset allocator to allocate anything new, even if the, all the trends that we just touched on, which I completely agree with, are kind of in your face. Um, and so that's, that's the cycle. For me, it's, it's, it was kind of 2005 to 2008 when everything blew up. 2008 to 2012 was a slow motion train wreck as people ran out of money and couldn't find new financing, baby thrown out with the bathwater. Um, and then 2012 to now is all right, there's a whole bunch of really interesting activity, digital starting to hit physical. You know, we're doing early stage investments of, of the five kind of top deals in the pipeline. Three of them, they don't even mention machine learning and AI. Three of them are based effectively on machine learning and AI. And like, that's not even the pitch. Um, I think the stuff's completely overhyped, but it's also real. Um, and so you're seeing all of these kind of digital uh, approaches actually starting to play into the physical world. And that's just kind of a whole new ball game and, and fits in a lot of ways, very well with traditional venture, and I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, I mean, I you know, eight years ago, I'd say energy efficiency, people wanted to do it, but those are tough deals. I, I guess I have two points. One is I think energy efficiency finally, finally is going to have its day, partly because of the cost of metering and communications has dropped, partly because they're starting to solve problems other than energy efficiency. It's, energy efficiency is the world's most boring problem, right? And you don't, and it's optional. But what's great about the new services that we're seeing is that they solve other problems, security, comfort, that kind of thing. I also think Pace is going to really accelerate. Pace commercials around 400 million last year should be 10 billion within three, four years. So you have new forms of funding coming into both residential and commercial uh, financing for efficiency that's going to really accelerate new technology adoption and scaling. And then my second point is sort of the PPA model, which is really what the solar industry is built on is being applied in new areas. It's pretty exciting. Energy efficiency, ground source heat pumps, water. That's a great structure to scale clean energy technology uh, broadly beyond solar, including in areas that are utility areas like water uh, and energy efficiency. And that's an exciting area. Yeah, I think all of these approaches are going to be valuable and they're going to be uh, uh, incremental ways to get to the problem. We have to keep in mind that the problem we're talking about is measured in tens of trillions of dollars. Well, it's the IEA estimates is uh, what, in, in the 40s of trillions, and the estimate that was in the uh, panel this morning, the first panel, was around 15 trillion. Measuring not quite apples to apples, but we're talking about a problem to decarbonize the world enough to meet goals that is measured in many tens of trillions of dollars of investment. And the only way that investment can be made is to be made with low cost capital. And so what we as a society need to do is to figure out how we're going to implement solutions at a vast scale. And part of the problem that we have as a society is we need to get more consensus around how we're going to let that occur. Because even when we have machinery that's quite proven, technologies that are quite proven, whether it's a well-proven wind turbine or a pumped uh, hydro uh, water turbine, that will both either be a generator or be a uh, pump, uh, that's old Old, old technology, decades old, fully proven. Uh, often it's not the technology that's the issue. It could be that it's just hard to get a permit. It's hard to get uh, 
a, a, a pricing model reflected into new worlds of how energy storage is going to be priced, whether it's a state law issue or it's a federal law, is it, is it power, is it transmission? So all kinds of issues to sort out. So that the challenges we have here are not just about technology. It's about taking a piece of machinery that may be perfectly proven. You get a warranty on, you can get bank financing on, and so on. But you then you have to figure out how does it get implemented into a project at scale. The project I used to work on some years ago is a pump storage facility that needs to be built. built being built at a uh, old Kaiser Steel uh, iron mine. The site looks like Mad Max. I mean, you could have filmed Mad Max there. And it's 1.3 gigawatts for like six hours, right? Enormous in California. It would facilitate enormous build-out of renewables. Instantly dispatchable either way when, we're, when we have curtailments of renewables going on at quite significant, especially in a high hydro year where we've got a lot of uh, inability to take the midday solar in. And so we've got a lot of environmental groups fighting that. I mean, if we as a society can't figure out what we want to get behind, whether it's the solar projects or whether it's wind projects or pump storage facilities on a Mad Max location, we're not talking about a pristine river that needs to be dammed, um, then we're going to have a lot of trouble achieving our goals, notwithstanding whatever great funding can come out of Silicon Valley into, into innovators, because the innovators can innovate all they want and succeed, but at the end of the day, we've got to get the innovations implemented and financed, and to get those implemented and financed, we need to be a lot more effective as a society in figuring out how to block non-technology and non-financing obstacles to those projects getting built at scale. So I, I totally agree with that, but you know, w one of the other big things that's happening is that a lot not enough, but a lot of generation and control is going into the private enterprise. So there's massive permitting problems, you know, as an investor, I won't, as a venture investor with a limited time frame, I won't touch any technology that has to go into those kinds of projects, partially for the bankability reason, partially because of the siting, permitting, and other issues that, that go into that. But what you can find is these distributed generation, uh, behind the meter storage, uh, efficiency uh, uh, kinds of products that actually kind of avoid all of that. And then right. the question is, you know, who's coordinating? And all, we had a discussion about that before, about price signals and, you know, how do you actually balance the grid when all of the decisions are being made in a very distributed fashion. But the fact of the matter is, is, you know, private people and enterprises can buy and build whatever they want behind the meter as long as they're allowed to interconnect. Um, and that, that is kind of the fundamental flaw is, is all of that central planning is starting to go out the door in some ways because as things scale behind the meter, it's going to take a while. I don't think there's any credible scenario that solves our climate problems behind the meter. Behind the meter is great, mm. and it makes a contribution. But I don't, I've never seen anyone put forth a credible story that solves our climate problems globally with solely with behind the meter, primarily with behind the meter related technology. You should fund all those, and, and, and I applaud you for doing it. I'm just saying that to meet our goals, we have huge needs to put lots of infrastructure into place worldwide, and we need to find ways to get that done. All right, so I, I actually couldn't agree more. I think the challenge is, is unless we go towards the you know, Chinese centralized government point of view, we certainly don't want the Trump administration making those decisions well, on our behalf. So yeah. how do we actually well, well, you know, I, implement that is my big question. I don't think, well, I'm not talking just about the U.S. I'm talking about globally. It's a global problem, right? And you know, we can all agree about Trump or whatever. We can leave Trump out of the room, right? Um, Can't do that. <laughs> this is, uh, this is not about Trump. It's about a need to figure out. And by the way, you know, my view is at least we also need to do a better job in California, right? In California, I, talk, I agree with Greg fully about pricing signals. Let's talk about pricing signals in California. California, we've got carbon pricing. Well, great. Anyone who took Econ 101, even if they dropped out after the third week, knows something about marginal pricing. And if you want to buy something, you should have it all turn out at the same marginal price. Well, what do we have in California? Well, in the most recent, by the way, failed auction, which was settled at the minimum price, we had carbon priced in the cap and trade program at $8 a metric ton. In the low carbon fuel standard, we priced carbon $75 to $125 a metric ton. 
If you look at the E3 report, a very definitive report, the implied cost of per metric ton avoided of, of uh, CO2 for uh, the RPS is somewhere between $400 and $800, depending on whether you have a high rooftop solar or, or, or low rooftop solar penetration. If you look at the SGIP, the Small Generator <coughs> Incentive Program, the implied price per avoided ton of CO2 is in the thousands. Uh, so we're spending a lot of money in California with the wrong pricing signals. Uh, if, if, if our goal is to mitigate carbon, mm -hmm. if our goal is to benefit particular things that we want at the, 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 the planet, central planning of California to decide what is best, then fine, we might want that kind of policies where we're particularizing how we're pricing carbon. But if the goal is to you know, reduce carbon emissions, we have a, a three order of magnitude difference in our carbon pricing within the state for the same atmosphere. So we can get into policy questions. So I, I, um, I, I proud, I'm proud of the fact that we, we managed to make it 33 minutes without saying the word Trump. Um, so that's potentially a good, good outcome so far. Um, so, yeah, so, so 2017, um, no, no one can really forecast what's going to go on in the future, right? So, so for me to ask you what you think is going to happen in 2022 is kind of crazy. But the thing that I'd like to get your takes on from, from your different vantage points is what gets you excited about today? I mean, you're, you haven't given up on the industry, the ecosystem, and you, and you still seem like you're pretty um, adamant about some things that are actually happening. What, what gets you excited every day? What gets you excited in the morning? What are you looking for? What are the trends? I'll begin with you again. Okay. <laughs> Well, in X47, we're, we're looking at energy, but we're looking at a lot of, uh, a lot of other areas as well. But uh, Siemens, uh, just for background, is, um, is a very big company uh, based in Germany with close to 100 billion in revenue. And a lot of that is energy-related revenue. So we are in um, power and gas. We're in um, other forms of generation. We're, we're in power delivery, the entire <clears throat> uh, electricity transmission and distribution infrastructure. We're in mobility, which is transportation. So many of our businesses are, are either driven by or heavily impacted by, by energy decisions. I think one of the things that has changed in the last few years, uh, going back to, to kind of the earlier question, which is continuing to keep me very enthused about this space in general, is that we're, we're seeing some changes. Um, first of all, um, and, and you know we're really in the business of, of startup innovations. So how can we uh, work with uh, with startups to keep Siemens competitive and to help them as well. And I think there's probably more opportunities now for kind of this big corporate strategic and startup uh, partnership um, to bring, you know, one plus one equals three type value than ever before. And there's some reasons for that. Um, first is that we're seeing our own customers being more amenable to, to startup innovations and um, uh, externally, uh, externally generated innovations. So, in the past, it used to be very difficult for startups, even with better technologies, to be able to approach conservative customer bases, like, like utilities, for example, without the validation of a big partner like Siemens. Um, today, I think that's changing, although Siemens uh, can still very much help in, in that equation. So what we try to do is work with some of the best startups, um, use their speed and agility and technology advantages, combine it with our a tremendous kind of domain expertise and customer relationships and um, and long standing kind of the stability of the ship, so to speak, to approach markets in new ways. Um, and I think Next 47, this new group that we just started that we're very excited about, which is just getting off the ground, is kind of a, an example of, of how corporates are changing, number one, in the space. So, so corporates themselves are being more uh, kind of accepting of startup innovations and, and, and external uh, externally generated uh, technologies. So we put in a billion dollar fund. Um, so we're going to be investing a lot of capital in the next in the next few years, uh, and we're taking the long view. This isn't just for the next two to five years. This is a long view about how we uh, create new value across all of our businesses. And you know, to, to your point about disruption, a company like Siemens, and this is actually why I came to Siemens in the first place, having a global footprint, being big, being around for 170 years, I, I actually believe that some of these big corporates are uniquely suited to address energy challenges um, that are global in nature and not localized or small. Um, so uh, I think um, the fact that, that customers are, are changing, they're slowly warming towards innovations and, um, and, and kind of uh, moving more at the speed of, of 
the ecosystems we see around us, for example, and the fact that corporates like Siemens are also uh, have changed, and it's not just Siemens, but other groups as well that have really upped, I think, the game in terms of corporate venture capital and bringing in flexible models for not just investing in companies, but also partnering with them ultimately uh, to bring value to fuel startup success, but also our success in addressing technology challenges and energy challenges of the future. I think those two things are, are, are trends that I've seen in the past five to 10 years um, that have me very excited specifically about this job. Sure. You're still in the game. Yeah, no, I, I yeah. try not to speak too much here. But, um, you know, the, there's there's a lot of different data points in here. And, you know, the thing that gets me up in general is thinking that you can make real venture and financial returns at the early stage investing in, in this broad space that at least, you know, congruent is defining as sustainability. There are so many, the macro trends are kind of very clear. Then you kind of get into the middle layer that Greg just articulated very well, urbanization trends, food, transportation, how do you actually deal with this massive urbanization uh, challenge that's going on? Where, where venture investments actually end up making money is kind of at the micro. It's like uh, we, have a, we have a product, we have a team, how do they make money, how do they make margin, how do they scale without breaking the bank and taking too much capital to actually grow their business? What's exciting to me in the sustainability space is that you know, we touched on this a little bit before, but everything out there in the physical world is starting to get instrumented <coughs> from a sensing perspective, and there are going to be control points that are being layered in to, to most things that are sold from, kind of from here on forward. You combine that with uh, low-cost distributed generation, whether it's solar and other things, uh, declining costs on energy storage. Um, it's a long, much longer discussion, gets a lot of uh, um, news cycles these days. It's kind of mostly out of the money today, but in five or ten years, that's just not going to be the case. Um, and you start to get really excited, not just about the technologies, but um, the business models and the changing business models to deploy these technologies into the ecosystem. Some of them are reliant on financing. I'm still on the board of the largest PACE originator and administrator in the country. Um, there's a lot of innovation here that kind of combines uh, technology, business models, and financing, actually, that you can deploy real stuff into the world and get paid for it. That's really exciting, and what's most exciting is seeing all the next generation of entrepreneurs actually walking through the doors with really interesting companies. That's, that's the exciting piece. Yeah, I totally agree with that last comment. I mean, 10 years ago, you had a very small pool of management with actual experience in clean energy, uh, not humble enough. Now you have a large pool of experience, capital, I mean, a large pool of managers who are humble because they've seen a lot of failures. I think that really matters. Ultimately, success in businesses comes down to management. Um, you know, half of more than half of all new power in both Europe and North America in the last three or four years has come from renewables. So it's no longer a marginal technology, and the cost curves are really steep, uh, and they're better than we expected. And so there's an inevitability about renewables becoming the global norm for both baseline and, and, and marginal power, and that the transition. So I drive this electric car, 125 miles a gallon. I haven't bought gasoline in probably three years, and it's great, right? I mean, I, I had to, I borrowed my wife's car the other day. It's a terrible mistake. I had to get gas. Um, and then finally, I think climate change and, or carbon is really becoming a defining brand issue very rapidly, especially for, for the next generation. And that means that it matters who you, so that, and that this brand piece of it is going to have an impact on who you can hire and who you can retain. And it's true for corporations. It's true for cities, which are accelerating down this curve towards self-defining around carbon mitigation, which is a whole set of secondary benefits, health, employment, variety of other things, and certainly corporations. I mean, the leading corporations, many started out of the Silicon uh, area, are defining themselves about going carbon neutral within five years. Those are the trendsetters. So I think there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic. I agree with that fully. And if I think a couple of interesting data points to just tie on. I on the management side, one of the things I get most excited about is I can't believe the quality of the students that I teach here. They're just so talented and they are so energetic and capable and that's all they're about, is trying to figure out how they can become part of some team and learn something. So we do have a crop and it's not just at Stanford. I do some stuff out at MIT as well and same kind of thing there. Uh, we have a, a generational shift in focus in terms of what what kind of talent we're going to see rising and what they'll be willing to work on and what they won't be. And that's also affecting the, uh, the gray hairs. If you saw the article in the Wall Street Journal on Total, um, 
uh, bringing its management team out to uh, Silicon Valley and trying to make the CEO trying to make sure his senior management team could, could smell the coffee of where things are going in the world. And uh, the awareness that uh, the bigger oil firms are starting to have, because they plan things in decadal time frames. They're not, they may have to report quarterly earnings, but they don't think in quarterly uh, time frames. They think in decadal time frames when you're going to go make an investment in pre-salt Brazil or you know, Arctic Circle oil and gas, it primes your thinking to start thinking in very long-term cycles. And I think it's starting to set in that this is not going to be a carbon-driven, hydrocarbon-driven world starting within their managerial you know, remit of, of the time frames they need to be thinking about. And that is a big change. And that is a big change to now they need to start thinking about, okay, well, what else and how do we adjust and how much of the resources do they have? Are they, in fact, going to be able to, you know, return and get a, get a return, recover and get a return on? And that's flowing through investors. It's flowing through uh, governmental thinking and so on. So I, I do think that and maybe even the, the uh, outlier positions of Trump are even accelerating some of that um, in terms of people on the pushback. So the, the, the fact is we've got a, a, a much more identifiable set of mindsets that are changing. And I think that's the most important thing. So as we uh, begin to, to wrap up the panel, I, I welcome any questions. Um, but uh, Professor Rogers, as you're speaking about your students, one of the things that I learned about teaching at Stanford is you can give a three hour lecture and the students will remember two bullets. So um, one of the things that, that I'll just take sort of my, my, uh, my privilege as moderator just to kind of say, uh, Three of the things that I've seen personally over the past 10 years that have changed since my time as, a, as an active uh, VC. Um, the first is a shift in, in purchase power. So before, everybody used to focus on the fact that utilities were the biggest customer of anything related to energy. And we're, we've seen over the past 10 years that that shift in, in purchasing power is actually um, changing and, and fundamentally driving new innovations down towards where the consumer is actually um, having much more strength in, in buying these things. The next is a shift in monetization. So one of the things that, again, if you think about traditional energy, it's in systems. Um, but one of the things that, that we're starting to see more and more of is actually a shift towards business models. So despite the fact that we see, you know, potentially Solar City or Tesla um, or Uber and Lyft as, as sort of being these one-off technology companies, they're actually the fundamental drivers of business model changes. And, and they're trying to focus on the third thing, which is a shift in value. Um, Ten years ago, every, every technology investment was a shift towards driving down the cost, right? So becoming the lower cost, lowest cost, best solar technology, lowest cost, best wind power generating technology, lowest cost, you know, car, whatever you want to call it. Um, and now the focus right now is, as we saw in, in Greg's presentation, um, four cents in Texas, two and a half cents a kilowatt hour wind contracts. Cost is no longer the issue. Now the focus is now on, on value. And this is actually where I 100% agree with you in terms of Siemens having a, a really opportunity to work with companies that Abe is investing in, is this ability to actually drive value for customers as being the, the biggest shift. So those are just my three points. Um, given the fact that there's no questions, I'll go with one more question. Oh, please. So, so while, while you come on up, up on the air, please, to the microphone, um, I'm going to part with one controversial thought from each of you. So please. I want you to think about one controversial thing where everybody's going to go <gasps> before well, you leave. I, I'll, I'll pass because I think I already gave my controversial comment about uh, California mispricing carbon. So I'll, I'll let others go with theirs. Hi, I'm Alan Sanstead, 1% Laboratory. Very fascinating panel. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, I'm sure so one thing I don't think was mentioned that happened between 2000. Uh, 7 2012 was the failure of national cl uh, climate legislation, right? The Waxman Markey bill. It, that, it failed when the Democrats controlled the White House, the Senate, and the House. Um, and so I want to pick up on something Dave said, um, or implied at least. Uh, I live and work in Berkeley, so this is all magic to me. But, um, and my interest is in um, clean energy for, the, uh, for dealing with climate change. Uh, it requires enormous, it's going to require enormous amount of investment, right? Enormous amount of investment. Um, but investment is not the same as venture capital. 
And what I, even back in, you know, around to the, prior to 2007, it was obvious a lot of people were going to lose a lot of money on some of the stuff that was being claimed. But now, if I'm understanding correctly, there are, there are true sort of venture capital possibilities that have a lot to do with uh, um, control, right? Uh, information, uh, machine learning by whatever name. That stuff is great, but you're right. It's not going to save the world. So what I'm sort of interested in is are there, when I think of a save, world saving things like large, uh, you know, large scale storage, true breakthroughs that might happen. But a lot of those seem to be still in kind of national lab stage, right? The fundamental science is not there yet. So I'm, I'm asking in a way, I wonder if, if I'm understanding this correctly, is that there are, there are definitely VC possibilities in the clean energy space, uh, but they are pretty micro and they're targeted and they're not, they're really, this is a really separate thing now from the kind of large scale investment that is needed to um, move toward a clean energy system, particularly given the lack of uh, pricing signals from the government anytime soon. Thanks. So is, is the question in terms of... The question is, am I understanding correctly that there are, there are you know, reasonable, relatively you know, uh, very innovative possibilities in the energy world in the area of how you visual, right? Information, control, and whatnot. But you're not looking at those. Those are not necessarily going to be Facebook, right? Um, I don't think it's not necessarily the size. And then as far as actual technical innovation that might be coming along, Yeah, I'm not not quite sure I got that the whole question, but that's all right. Let me try to let me try to hit the the, the point, which is, I yeah, I generally agree that what, for example, what I'm doing, you know, I'm, I'm we'll be deploying something around eighty million dollars, you know, into the sector. That is not going to solve climate problems. Um, it's got it has to scale in general. Um, in general, when you're talking about technology solutions, there is not that, that need to scale to address these problems. There's really a divide of like, hey, do we need new technology to address this, or can we scale at lower cost of capital the existing technology to address this? In the former category, um, there is not really a solution right now. The closest this would be kind of you know generally bucketed in the policy and government world. Um, we all know that in the U.S. at least that doesn't really exist. The only real group out there that is focused on those kinds of challenges and they're not they're not quite investing yet is the breakthrough energy uh, uh, coalition or breakthrough energy ventures which is bill gates's coalition which has i mean it's real money but it's still not the trillions you need it's a billion okay that's something um and you know they they may have the capability to take something out of early stage lab and over 10 years actually get it out into the market that doesn't fit the traditional venture model uh, and we very much hope that they're successful but you know, I'm actually, despite the fact that I invest in early stage technologies, I'm a big believer that to actually address the systemic problems worldwide, um, it's much more about deploying. It's much more about clearing the roadblocks and from a policy uh, um, perspective to actually get existing technology out into the market. And again, unfortunately, that's, in, in, at least in the U.S., that's kind of a policy exercise. Um, and that's unaddressed. Uh, hi. Uh, my, I'm, I'm Pranav. Uh, my question was about sort of uh, return on, on capital in, in sort of energy investments as opposed to consumer internet or whatever, right? So, so I've been talking to, to VCs in, in sort of in, in your world, uh, um, and the, the sort of general sense I get is that most, uh, well, a large fraction of, uh, of ventures in energy are capital intensive and, and therefore. Uh, Consumer internet VCs don't like them, and, and because because they, they're looking for capital efficient uh, ventures. So then the question is, well, why are you guys doing? Why aren't you doing consumer internet too? And and uh, so so is is there something sort of fundamentally changing about the the, the sort of the fact that things are data driven, and so so the, the ventures are capital capital efficient, or or is it just lower returns business? I'm talking too much, so somebody else. I'll, I'll just take a shot. I mean, the, the reason Siemens is not in consumer inter internet is because it's not in our business. So we're going we're gonna to be strategic. Um, one, one thing just to, just to note is that what we're seeing in energy is, is and I mentioned this briefly, is we're, we're seeing less pure play energy companies. So keep in mind that there are many companies out there that are horizontal in nature that can still have a huge impact on energy markets. 
So those are very much in our in our interest uh, in our interest landscape as well. Uh, so we're seeing a lot more of that. It, you don't have to be labeled a, an energy company anymore to have impact in the energy space. And my controversial statement of the day, just to jump into the, the question that addresses this, is that you can make money in early stage investing. And for this room, uh, in sustainability and energy in general, for this room, I'm sure that's not controversial. It's a very controversial discussion for traditional asset allocators, as I mentioned before. People do not think that you can make money. And so, you know, fundamentally, I believe you can. You have to be contrarian to make money in financial markets, otherwise you're too late. And so the idea would be to invest early uh, against the trend. And the problem is it's not going to be, it's going to be five or 10 years before anybody knows whether I'm a total idiot or smart. Um, and that's kind of a, it's a, it's a measurement problem from that perspective. Hi, I'm Venu. Uh, so my question is regarding what Greg told me uh, about a clean energy uh, financing gap. As, uh, Greg told like, you know, uh, there's a financing gap for small and medium projects. Why is that? Because if you have a uh, proper business, if uh, you have a good business model, and if you have a good uh, revenue model, and you, have, uh, you are able to show that you are able to generate a good revenue and have profits, why is it so difficult uh, to get funding for those projects? Yeah, I mean, so I differentiate between uh, software, predominantly software companies, where they may need two, three, four million dollars before they get to profitability. And a, and, and a company that's a, for a developer of, you know, a, a capital intensive uh, renewable energy or energy efficiency project. And so the problem is they, they don't have a balance sheet. So the valuation they get from a VC firm is not enough to use for project financing. And they're not large enough, don't have a track record large enough to get debt mm -hmm. from a bank, say, which needs to be 30, 40, 50 million dollars. So they're sort of stuck in that place. And they end up being service providers. So they'll go and they'll take their 8 to 12 percent cut for developing a solar project. Someone else will buy it. But that's not what they want to be. They don't want to be a service provider. They want to be an owner. And mm -hmm. so what's interesting about this model of having low cost debt going in with warrants into a company uh, and having them use that money to do project financing and then those projects secured by PPA and available to the, the, the lender as recourse, mm -hmm. that's a model that solves this generic problem, which is again specific to capital intensive uh, clean energy development companies, not to capital light software oriented companies. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a big gap. Yeah. I get it. Because in generally, if you see in energy or renewables, like for example, in power, power industry, Generally, people start training if they need funding, they start from a low capacity unit and slowly, slowly they would develop it. So in that case, so I was thinking in that case, how would that look? Uh, getting funding if it's a small unit and if it's a small, uh, uh, you know, if it's a, the investment is very small, will that be a small, bigger issue for getting funding and all? You know, one of the things I think that uh, we talked about earlier, the sort of 2005 through 2007 experience of clean tech investing is that people underestimated how hard it is to make sales, close sales, you know, build channel relationships. And so your, it, this, the, the time it took to build the revenue to support the, the company growth and management and sales, those two things never met. And so mm -hmm. a lot of companies had very exciting technology, large prospective list of clients, it took them much longer to close, much longer to scale from pilot to, uh, to a large, large, uh, scale contract. And that, I think, was probably a large, a, a, an explanation, a very large portion of failures for companies that, from a paper perspective, looked viable. They had a good management team, good thesis, good plan to go to market. It was a rational investment decision from a buyer's perspective. But buyers aren't rational. Mm -hmm. They're risk averse. And unless you're solving a problem that has to be solved, they're not going to invest if it's optional. And energy efficiency would fall into that class of optional. Thank you. Greg, while you have the mic, something controversial? Yeah, really controversial. Um, can I see a show of hands of the number of people who are carbon neutral in their life today? So if people at, St so one person is, so if people at Stanford aren't doing it, what, you know, WTF, right? So I've been yakking about this and working in it for 25, 30 years. It took me until three or four years ago to get solar and an electric car. The cost for us of going carbon neutral as individuals is a couple hundred dollars a year. It's a fraction of 1%. So if we're going to get serious about climate change, we got we to gotta walk the walk, guys, and not just talk the talk. So that's my controversial statement. Awesome. Final words on the go. Do you want to ask a question? 
All right, question. Uh, all right. That's, uh, uh, Bill Brown with a, a group called A Rivers Capital Net Power. Uh, I've been listening with great interest about the discussion today, and, and, and it really is dealing with a problem that we tried to solve. And we face this. We had uh, this is my partner, Miles Palmer, here. We went to MIT many years ago, more than, you know, farther uh, years ago than I would care to admit. But um, we got together and we had these big technologies. We had these big ideas. And we thought, how do you execute these big ideas? We came out and did the Sand Hill Road thing. And, and people, uh, even to this day, claim that they offered us a lot of money uh, just to say that they didn't turn us down. But um, what we understood that we, we had to do is it wasn't the VC solution. We were beyond both the capital intensity as well as the time horizon of VC. Well, then we look at the corporate solution. Well, the problem with the corporate solution is, is at the VC level of corporates, we were too big for the VC level of corporates. We needed you know, $150 million for the first plant. That's bigger than a VC a corporate is going to ever willing to bet. Then you sort of think, well, it must be that there are people inside of corporations who are inventing this stuff. But then you run smack into the, into the face of Clay Christensen's innovator's dilemma. All the reasons that corporations intrinsically don't do these large over the horizon innovations inside the corporation. So we sort of box ourselves into the solution was we had to develop our technology to the point where we could get into the C-suite of the corporations. So we got into the C-suite of Exelon. We got into the C-suite of Toshiba. We got into the C-suite of Chicago Bridge and Iron. And across all of those, we raised several hundred million dollars. And we're building a pilot plant down in Houston right now that will show that the world can meet every climate target it has without having to pay more for electricity. And, but it took a totally different approach. We had to basically, we turned ourselves at Eight Rivers Capital, we're in Mini Bell Labs because we got a bunch of technology geeks and engineers who like to invent stuff. And my background on Wall Street with Miles' background of building defense systems basically allowed us to develop it to a certain level where we could get into the C-suite of companies. And so that's another, that's another approach to this that's totally off the map of what generally people think of. Thank you, that's great. Well, thank you very much for uh, patience and, and participation on Friday afternoon. If you'd give me a chance to thank our panel again.